another very stormy evening to all of you, my dear friends. Um, it's about to come into some bad weather, so we'll uh, try to do a Bible study before it gets really bad and the power goes out. <laughs> so, okay, um, we left off in our part 32 Bible study on the life of Christ with Jesus telling about um, giving a few parables, and we ended with the parable of the prodigal son. We're going to be going over two more parables today, and um, these are, uh, every one of these, there's just such deep lessons to learn in them. Let's just get right into it. And he said also unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. So this rich man is getting on to his steward for uh, wasting his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer a steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig to beg, I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. He's speaking of the people whom owe his Lord money. He says, well, I'll go and do something nice for them. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then said he to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write four score, or eighty. And the Lord commanded the unjust servant, because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Charles Ellicott noted about this parable, which is very unique from all the other parables that Jesus speaks on. As, as you can tell, I just read the entire thing. Now let's analyze it and try to uh, gather what Christ was saying. There is perhaps no single parable that has been subjected to such various and discordant interpretations as this of the unjust steward. In order to, I believe, gather the meaning from this parable, one would have to first know about how this steward had gathered his own wages. And I believe that ancienthebrew.org might have this right. According to Dr. Bain, it was discovered that in the first century, at the time of Jesus, the master, the employer, did not pay the steward, the employee, a wage. Instead, a steward made his money by adding his fees onto the bills of his master's debtors, the customers. When the debtor receives the bill from the steward, he does not know what amount on the bill belongs to the master and what amount belonged to the steward. Only the steward would know. When the debtors would pay their bill to the steward, the steward would pocket his portion of the bill and then forward the remaining money to his master. As this steward is called unrighteous, we can assume that he was placing an extraordinary high amount on the bills for his fee in order to make large amounts of money at the expense of his master and his master's debtors. However, when he found out he was going to be fired, he took the debtor's bills and reduced or eliminated the amount owed to him thereby currying favor with these debtors in the hopes that one of them may hire him due to his perceived generosity. Jesus himself makes this kind of clarification. He tells the lesson right after, and then we have to apply what he says to this parable. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. So he's talking about faithfulness in the least and how this unrighteous mammon is trusted in our care on this earth. And um, that will bear on the eternal rewards that we're also given. Let's just uh, dig a little bit more into all this. The counsel is to use wealth in doing kindness to the poor. 
and the implied doctrine that doing so will be to our eternal benefit. Friends of value for the eternal world can be gained even by the mammon of unrighteousness. Now, what's he speaking on? Well, mammon, first of all, means money. So is he saying that money is evil? I don't think so. Here, unrighteous mammon is contextually opposed to the true riches, applying the unrighteous to the worldly and the true riches to spiritual or heavenly. So we have to view this mammon of unrighteousness more as worldly uh, material. This lesson of a worldly steward is thereby given for an example to Christians. Those things which we are trusted with should be put to proper use to even utilize the unrighteous or worldly things for the glory of God. Only then can we be trusted with heavenly matters. Jesus says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least, meaning wicked in the least, is unjust also in much. So if you're wicked with earthly money, then how can you possibly be trusted with heavenly things with far greater significance and they're your own? We have to remember that. To be faithful with money is to acknowledge that we have it as stewards, not as possessors down here on this earth, and shall have to give an account of our stewardship. The word of warning was meant, we may believe, especially for the disciples. They, coming for the most part from the poorer classes, thought that they were in no danger of worshiping mammon or money. They are told probably with special reference to the traitor Judas, who would have been listening to this. This may have been a forewarning to him. Look, don't love money. That the love of money may operate on a narrow as well as on a wide scale. And that wrongdoing in the one case tests character not less perfectly than in the other. And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's. Now, what, what's Jesus meaning by that? Who shall give you that which is your own, that which is another man's? The lesson of this verse is that nothing which we possess on earth is our own. It is entrusted to us for temporary use. Do you not remember what it says in First Chronicles? But who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee, God, and of thine own have we given thee. He's, he's saying... Even in this verse, he says, even the sacrifices, these bulls and all the land and everything that we give you, God, you already own. God is just seeing if we will uh, give it back. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him because Jesus was probably also targeting them with this speech, and they knew it. But they derided him, and he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. That's so scary. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. They derided him, Benson noted, concerning the true use of riches and the impossibility of men serving God and mammon at the same time. It's, Jesus is telling them, look, you serve, you love money. You think that you love God, but really you love money. And they're mad about this because they want to love money and God. But Jesus continues, the law and the prophets were until John Baptist. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. Now, why is Jesus bringing this up? Well, I think the pulpit had it spot on. Divorce for the most trivial causes was sanctioned by the rabbis. And even such men as Hillel, the grandfather of Gamaliel, whom tradition speaks of as the rabbi whose lectures were listened to by the boy Jesus at the age 12, taught that a man might divorce his wife if in the cooking she burnt his dinner or even oversalted his soup. So Jesus is telling them how lightly that they actually um, obey the law of Moses. He says, you really don't obey the law. It, he knew that they were fake. The whole time, Jesus is just sees right through them. He says, you're like whited sepulchers, but inside you're just dead. 
Now we're coming up on the parable of uh, the rich man and Lazarus, another well-known parable just throughout the whole earth. Everyone knows about this parable. Here also there is a certain appearance of abruptness, but the sneer of Luke 16, 14 explains the sequence of thought. On the one side, among those who listened to our Lord were the Pharisees, living in the love of money and of the enjoyments which money purchased. On the other were the disciples, who had left all to follow their master, poor with the poverty of beggars. So right here, Jesus is generalizing both groups, the rich man with the Pharisees and Lazarus kind of representing all the poor. The Pharisees had mocked at the council that they should make friends with the mammon of unrighteousness who should receive them into everlasting habitations. They are now taught, and the disciples are taught also, what comes of the other friendship that men, for the most part, secure with money. If this rich man in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, if he had done well by Lazarus, then Lazarus, um, it's believed that would have accepted him into paradise, that he would have gotten saved by doing by a change of heart. You know, by repenting is what I'm getting at, not by works. The works would have just shown what had happened inwardly. But this rich man, his heart was darkened, and he wanted no part of helping the poor or worshiping God. There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. This is the reason why I believe this is an actual true event, true historical event. We never do see in parables Jesus giving a name to anyone. But right here, we hear of this man named Lazarus, but he doesn't know the rich man. Remember, he says, I never knew ye. So he doesn't know him, but by him being rich. But not only is Lazarus poor and in poverty and just begging for crumbs, but he's full of sores. The Greek word for full of sores is somewhat more technical than the English one. Literally, ulcerated, one which a medical writer like Luke would use to express a generally ulcerous state of the whole body. This would have been just so painful. And Lazarus was desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. The only dogs that would, could have been found in the East, especially during those days, um, were the wild and neglected pariah dogs, which run about masterless and are the common scavengers. But just for a little bit more clarification, he's covered with ulcers and the dogs are the only things that are helping him. Beasts are better than humans in this particular case. Afflicted not only with poverty, but with loathsome and offensive ulcers, such as often are the accompaniments of poverty and want. These circumstances are designed to show how different was his condition from that of the rich man. He was clothed in purple. The poor man was covered with sores. He fared sumptuously. The poor man was dependent even for the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. And if you also notice the company of the two, the rich man, he had all kinds of, he was very popular and very uh, well known and respected and we'll come to that right here in a second but he was uh, very well known and Lazarus doesn't even have a home and dogs are his company now we're given insight probably the best insight as far as Christ's parables as to what happens after death between the lost and the saved and it came to pass that the beggar Lazarus died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. No angels to carry him, but it does say that he was buried. It never does say that Lazarus was buried. The rich man was buried. This is not said of the poor man. Burial was thought to be an honor, and funerals were, as they are now, often expensive, splendid, and ostentatious. This is said of the rich man to show that he had every earthly honor and all that the world calls happy and desirable. And the beggar died. His burial was too unimportant to even mention. But we're told about how Lazarus is taken to Abraham's bosom right here. Now, what is that? It's widely believed that before the resurrection of Christ, because we know that he was the first among many brethren, he took captivity captive, and everything kind of changed after Christ. But 
before Christ, for the Old Testament saints that passed away, it's believed that within the realm of the dead, which is called Sheol in the Old Testament, but Hades in the New, but in the in the earth, it's believed that there were uh, there was this chasm put that the damned went to one place of torment. And the other place was called Abraham's bosom, where they stayed with Abraham. And one must also observe how we're not told how long that the separation... We know that Lazarus died first, because he's the first mentioned. That's what we assume. But Lazarus died first. He could have been in Abraham's bosom for years. And then the rich man dies and sees him right here. So it's not as if they died on the same day, we're not to believe. But the rich man dies and is buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, notice this, he calls Abraham father, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Notice, he doesn't pray to God. He's not saying, Father God, help me. No, who's he talking to? Abraham. And he calls him father. And he says, Abraham, have mercy on me. You see how there's, there's a big point in this. Just as so many of the Jews rely upon them just being Jews, them being seeds of Abraham. And they're trying to get in on the credit of Abraham. They're trying to ride off of their ancient father, Abraham, instead of uh, seeking for themselves the salvation needed, which is only through Christ. His intense longing seems to be for companionship while talking with Abraham. Oh, for a friend, he seems to say, who could speak to me, comfort me, give me the smallest alleviation of the pain I suffer? What picture of a hell was ever painted by man comparable to this vision of eternal solitude, gathered alone by remorseful memories described by Jesus? But he makes this very odd request. He says, send Lazarus, like order him around. But he makes this very odd request. Send Lazarus down here to me. Yeah, that, that's going to happen. That he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Notice how it was Lazarus begging for crumbs in, on, the, on the earth. And now it's the rich man begging for just crumbs from Lazarus now you see how the humbled are exalted and the exalted humbled Jesus speaks of this there is something terribly significant in the fact that it is the tongue that suffers most in that agonizing flame the scripture reads how the power of life and death rests with the tongue and how the things of the heart come out through the mouth and how by our words you, you shall be justified, and by our words you shall be condemned. Now it's this tongue of this man that is just so in pain. That was the organ of the sense which the man had pampered by his riotous and sumptuous living. That is now the chief instrument of retribution. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now is he comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And meaning, even if I wanted to send Lazarus, I'm not allowed. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. The reiterated appeal to Abraham, notice he's still not praying to God, as father is suggestive, as speaking out that in which too many of the rich man's class put an undue trust, resting on the fatherhood of Abraham rather than on that of God. Send him to my father's house, no waking up of good in the heart of the lost, but bitter reproach against God in the old economy, as not warning him sufficiently. The answer of Abraham is they are sufficiently warned. And I like that point. It's it's basically like the rich man is saying, if if they see a wonderful miracle, like someone rising from the dead, like Lazarus coming back to them from the grave, that I didn't get to see. But if they get to see it, then though it's almost like see he still has this selfish heart to this. There's a lot to read in on this rich man and Lazarus, and it's also very striking how. 
this rich man is not asking to be relieved himself of these flames and of these torments. He's not asking that. I believe that there's a sense of no hope in hell. And, and we've discussed this before in our prior studies about how they, it, they, it's, it's a place of hopelessness. But notice also what he says, that he may testify unto them. Albert Barnes noted, may testify unto them, or may inform them of what is my situation and the dreadful consequences of the life that I have led. It is remarkable that he did not ask to go himself. He knew that he could not be released, even for a so short a time. His condition was fixed, and he knows it. Abraham then said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them, I meaning in the Old Testament. They have the Old Testament. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Moses and the prophets were enough to teach them that a life of self-indulgent luxury was evil in itself and therefore must bring with it in the end shame and condemnation. They knew exactly to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. But this has been always from the, the greatest of commandments. And the man had also known to love thy neighbor as thyself, which he did not do with Lazarus. And Abraham said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And that's that'll give you cold chills if you really know. And plus, the man who is saying it, Christ is telling this parable, and he says, "You will not believe even after I rise from the dead. You will not believe me about the afterlife, even after I prove that I have been there and come back. I give three days for you all to know I'm dead. Put watch over it, and then I come back." show myself to hundreds and hundreds of people and you still don't believe there's nothing else that can be done you are a lost soul but there's also a little bit of something else before we close on this there's a little bit of something else that may be hinted at we are accustomed rightly enough to look on our lord's own resurrection as leading to the great fulfillment of these words which is rightly so we should not forget however that there was another fulfillment more immediately following on them in a few weeks, or even days, tidings came that Lazarus of Bethany was sick. And yet a few days more, that Lazarus did rise from the dead. A, a man named Lazarus was risen from the dead. And they still don't believe. <laughs> and yet that wonder also brought about no repentance. Scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees and priests simply took counsel together that they might put Lazarus also to death. They wanted to kill Lazarus the second that they heard about it. We can hardly believe the coincidence of name and fa in fact in this instance to have been undesigned. Jesus knew that he would raise Lazarus from the dead in just a few days. He was going to do that. And he's telling them about this man named Lazarus. And he's telling them about this rich man begging for Lazarus to rise from the dead to show them whom, whom um, to, to repent tell them of the gospel, and here it physically plays out right in front of them. There are many proofs afforded from the unseen world, but those proofs are not intended chiefly for their end, in order that mortals may repent. Another and a different Lazarus was raised to life, and yet they did not believe. You see, you can show miracle after miracle after miracle to somebody. I, it, it astonishes me how atheists can, like men that that or women even, they can have they can be in the delivery room having a baby, which is the most bizarre of miracles. How the brain forms and the eyes and all of these complex things of uh, you know the brain is the most complex organism in the entire universe, and it forms in just nine months, and it happens all the time. So miracles in themselves is just not enough for a dark heart. They just hate God. I've said that numerous times to many different atheists. They just hate God. They want to do their own thing. Every single person in hell is there because of themselves. It's not because God forced them to go. God is not like that. He desires none to perish, but all to come into repentance. And... Uh, that is, that's the closer of this. 
But thank you all for joining me once again for part 33, my friends. Hopefully, God willing, we'll be picking up in part 34 here in a few days. Lord of peace be with you. Amen.